Well, thank you very much for coming. My name is Abba Shapiro. We're going to do power tips in uh, Adobe Premiere Pro. Is everybody enjoying Mac so far? Yes. How many people is your first time? How many first timers? Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. This is the best conference I've ever had the opportunity to speak at over 25 years of speaking. It's a lot of fun. Make sure you go to Sneaks. Make sure you go to Bash. Make sure you talk to the people who have been to Max before because they are eager to tell you all the tips and secrets you need to know. Okay? And the other thing is just to have fun. So we're going to try to do 75 minutes of premier tips to get you fast-tracked just so I have a sense of the experience level in the audience, an audience of four or 500 people. How many people here are relatively new to Premiere, maybe using it a year or less? Okay. How many people have been using it like two to five years? A lot of you, that's awesome. It's a great application. How many people are really long-term, hardcore, five and plus? That's great. I got, how many people raised their hand three times? <laughs> so this, this is great. So let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to do today. And it's just going to be a lot of tips and techniques. And first of all, I want to thank you for coming to take this class. If you like it and you want to tell your friends who are new to Max to come take it, I'm doing this session again on Wednesday. And as I said before, the idea is we're going to show you some of the best trimming and keyboard shortcuts and ways you can optimize your system. It's full of power tips. And just to give you an idea what a power tip is versus a tip, and I will explain that for a specific reason in that we have people who have been here for a year. Here for, if you've been here for a year, you've waited too long for this class. But <laughs> people have been using it only about a year. The tips are probably good, but if you've been using it five years, I want to make sure that I also do some depth. So you're going to get kind of two levels of tips here. So the idea is if you walk out of here with maybe 10 or 15 new tips that can make your workflow faster, where you said, oh, I wish I knew that last week, that's success. Because if you can save an hour a week by using some of these shortcuts, think about that, 52 hours a year. It's like having an extra week of time to take vacation or something. So garner what you can. The slide deck will be available at the end of Max. Okay, so they'll post that to the Max link. But feel free to take pictures and take notes. And let's just get started. Let's talk about uh, what a power tip. The Oxon Grav tool. Now I'm going to be toggling back and forth between Premiere and my uh, presentation. Sometimes that's where I get a little bit messed up. Great at Premiere, not real great at PowerPoint and Keynote. So. What is a power tip? The accent grav key or the uh, tilde key. How many people have heard of the tilde key in the room? That's awesome. That's a tip, not a power tip. For those who haven't seen this, let me show you what it can do. If I am hovering my mouse over any one of my windows, if I hit the tilde key or the accent grav key, same key, upper left-hand corner of your keyboard, it will bring that panel full screen. And this is great when you're working with a finite amount of space, such as on a laptop. So I can just toggle it back and forth with the tilde key. So that's considered a tip. You know what's considered a power tip? A power tip is what would happen if I hit control tilde? Control tilde will bring my image full screen without an interface so I can play it back for my client. How many people knew control tilde? How many did? How many are happy they know it now? Excellent. So those are the kind of things that we're going to be talking about. Different ways with shortcuts, different ways that you can increase your workflow. So let's go back and switch over. I'm going to, to get out of that, you simply hit the exit key. If the exit key works. And thank you for coming. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Nothing, OK, let's go. Skip slide. I think I'm on the slide. I was doing so great for just a moment. It was, it did work finally, but I really was. But you know that touchpad on a Mac? Oh well. Okay, so here we are, we're back again, switch over to my slides, and we're back in business again. So, control tilde, for those who want to know that, is full screen. Okay, here's some other things, and I'm going to maybe skip some of my slides. I have a lot more slides than we can cover in 75 minutes, but I'm going to post all of them as we go through. So, for instance, a lot of times when you're editing, you know, you have your playhead and your cursor, and you want the playhead to jump to the cursor. So this is kind of like a power tip for a, a more advanced user. So you can control this. I'm going to go ahead and hit high. 
move that over. And if you want to create any kind of a keyboard shortcut, now let me kind of explain what's there, because I saw a couple people kind of wondering um, what was actually going on. So I'm going to switch over to here, go to my keyboard shortcuts. And I was just teaching this on a PC earlier, so now I'm switching back my brain to a Mac. Here we go. So. So if you notice, move playhead to cursor doesn't have a keyboard shortcut. Now I'm going to assign this one. I'm going to use the function key of, oh, I'll just use the numeric key of one. That's good for now. It warns me that it would be select camera. We're not doing multi-camera. So I'm going to hit OK. So now as I'm going through, if I'm playing, now I saw some confused faces. My playhead is not where my cursor is. My cursor can be over here, so I can scroll anywhere I want. If I hit that one key, come on, you can do that. This is just kind of tricking me out here. Hit the wrong things. That one thing threw me off. I'll, I'll catch my, uh, my groove again. Yeah, we're going to skip that. I'm going to come back to that. That was uh, threw me off there on my own notes. OK, so. Let's go back to something that works a little bit smoother for me, and that's smooth scroll editing, another change you can make. So if we look here at the way Premiere works, if I'm playing to the end of my timeline, and I'm zooming here to my timeline, I'll be going back here. And when you play, and if you notice, you play, it gets to the end, and, and then you have to I wait. I play the piano, and I teach. And it jumps, and it keeps and playing. I so if I want it to follow, I'm going to go into the preferences. And under the preferences, under playback, there is an option. And it moved it on me. I'm, is the option to turn on smooth scrolling, which one you go down once, and there we are. So, the, uh, it's up there, it's up there. yeah, I'm, I'm uh, I, uh, I can't see. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it's up there. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Smooth scrolling, as you can see right there. So if you switch it to that, I'm going to hit OK. I want you to see how this playback works when we get to the end of the timeline. So this way, as you're watching, you don't have to have the jumps. So this is one so thing that I really I like to turn on. Dancing and teaching and doing photo shoots. So let's jump back and take a look at some other options that we have. I want to talk to you a little bit about audio, because I like the audio meters, but I think the audio meters can be, uh, give you back a little more information. So here's what we're going to do is uh, change some things with the audio meters, and I'm going to teach you some ways that you can avoid getting your uh, ears blown out when you're working with sound. OK? So what I want to do is, first of all, when I play something, take a look at the audio meters on the right side. I am happy. They're pretty, but they're not giving me a lot of information. So what I want to do is I want to change some of the aspects of it. If I right click on it, the first thing is the color gradient's really pretty, but I want to know at what point I'm good, which is green, yellow, which is caution, and red, which I should start worrying about. And with the gradient, it's really hard to tell. So I like turning the gradient off. The other things that I like to do is I like to know when I'm hitting my maximum volume levels and what my valleys are, what the lower points are. So I'm going to turn on a couple of other features. I'm going to say show valleys. That'll show the softest areas of my audio. And instead of having dynamic peaks, I'm going to do static peaks. And take a look at what happens when I switch over to this. It gives me a lot better feedback. See, I can see how soft, how loud, and it hangs there. So if I have a point where it's getting really loud, I can easily see that. And I like working my meters that way. And this is a great way when I want to see something for audio mixing. And while we're talking about audio, when I'm doing any kind of a final mix, I find that it's hard to see the meters sometimes. I want to see those biggers. 
bigger. And you can easily reconfigure your workspace so they can be bigger. And that's one thing that's very helpful when you're working with Premiere is being able to switch workspaces and have something that's more functional for the way that you work. So if I wanted to switch a workspace, and just in general, I'll give you an idea for workspaces. We have four basic windows here, but it, for some reason, you know, you know you can adjust something by grabbing an edge and dragging it. So if I'm using editing, but I'm not bringing clips in, I can always make that bigger. And I can save any of these workspaces very easily. I would just go down to my existing workspace and I would save it as a new one so I can jump back. I'm not gonna do that right now. But in addition to being able to reconfigure the size of your windows, you can reconfigure what's inside those panels. You can, for instance, move a tab. I'm gonna show you one thing that I love about workspaces is you can switch between them very easily at the very top of the interface. So if you're doing color correcting, if you're doing effects, it reconfigures the interface of your workspace so that you can see work a little bit smoother, work a little bit better. The other thing is once you have switched these, you'll notice that I'm gonna adjust this and I wanna get back to where I was, all I have to do is go to any workspace that I'm in and simply double click on it, it gives me the option to return to that workspace. So that's really kind of nice. But now let's say I wanna switch, or I wanna format it the way that I like it. I can grab any panel and move it. So for instance, if I want my media panel to be in the upper left hand corner, instead of being next to where my project panel is, I can drag it into that window. And when I drag it up, I have a couple of options here. If you notice, I can let go of it in the middle of the interface, and there's a large purple square, or I can drop it on any of the edges on one of the flaps, and I get a different result. If I drop it directly in the center, it just adds that tab to the existing panel. If I grab it, and instead of dragging it into the center, I grab it and drop it onto one of the flaps, it will create a separate panel and then I can save this. So that's really nice. And I configure things, whether I have two screens or if I personally like the way that I set up my audio or my color correcting, and then I can save that. So that's just kind of the background for what I wanna show you, which is the audio meters. And I'm gonna reset this back to the default. And what you can do is instead of leaving your meters here, you can grab the meter. It's kind of tricky to, to grab this one little section. You have to hit just the right spot. He's aiming for the right spot. My friend, the computer is not being good to me at all today. Not the right spot at all. But that's really big. Never done that before. Okay. We'll go back, we'll give it one more shot. We're gonna use the trackpad here instead of the mouse. Worked beautifully yesterday. There we go, I think I'm dragging it. I'm gonna drag it and put it right up here on the flap. Aha, that worked. And now let me go ahead and reconfigure this just a little bit. And now, when I'm editing, I can do playback and really see what my meters are doing. So, of course, once I get this successfully moved, I do save this as a workspace because you saw how hard it was for me to get there. But it does allow me a lot of flexibility. I'm gonna go ahead and return back to my basic workspace because I wanna to talk to you a little bit about just some basic keyboard navigation and then we'll jump back into the slides and I'll support that because it seems like the slides hate me and the Premiere will like me a lot better. So, for those who've been using it for a while, I know a lot of people do dragging and dropping versus keyboard shortcuts. Personally, however you are successful at editing, if you get paid to edit something, you're an editor. You don't have to be purely keyboard, you don't have to be purely mouse, whatever stylistically works for you. The good thing about Premiere Pro is there's like four or five ways to do everything. The bad thing about Premiere Pro is there's four or five ways to do everything. <laughs> so you don't have to know all of those ways, but I wanna show you a couple of ways that may be faster for you if you're dragging things around or you're not taking some of the keyboard shortcuts that are really very useful to your best advantage. So we're gonna talk about just navigation, and this works out really well whether you're in the preview monitor, the program monitor, that would be you know, your source or your destination, or even if you're looking at clips in the browser. So the way you wanna navigate anything is you wanna be able to, first off, the space bar is your starting and stopping. You don't wanna necessarily always be looking for this play button, 
Um, it reminds me of my VCR and I have to go home and change it back from flashing 12 to flashing one because of the time change, but that's a whole different story. And so what I wanna do is the space bar will play. And I'm gonna bring the volume down because that way you don't have to, uh, you can hear me and I'm not competing with the music. So if you put your right hand on the keyboard, they naturally fall in the following keys. With your thumb on the space bar, your three fingers in the middle are J, K, and L. J will play backwards. L will play forwards. So that's basic and that's something that you should know, but it gives you a lot more power when you start adding the K key, the key that's in between it, in between. So if you hold down that K key, and when you now tap the L key, which was playing forward, but when you tap it, you can move forward one frame at a time. You can be very precise. Holding down the K key and then tapping the J key will track you backwards one frame at a time. So that's great. So now J, K, and L, you can navigate. Step at a time, play in normal motion. If you choose, you can hold down K and L, another way to attack this, and it's gonna play forward in slow motion. And actually, this is a slow motion clip, so let's go back to a, uh, a basic clip here, all the way back to the beginning. So K and L, playing forward in uh, slow motion, and J and K at the same time, rewind in slow motion. So now you can play step at a time, slow motion, normal speed. You can also fast forward and rewind. And all that's required to do that is multiple taps of either the J key or the L key. So if you double tap the L key, you'll play forward or fast forward. And if you triple tap, it plays even faster and you can even quad tap to really very quickly skim through a clip. So multiple taps on the J key for fast rewind, multiple taps on the L key will bring you to fast forward. Now where the power really comes into play when you're starting to edit is usually you're marking ins and outs. So, you know, the keyboard shortcut for in would be, what do you guess, what do you think it is? It's not a trick, I, and the keyboard shortcut for out? Oh, so they're right above J, K, and L. So if I'm navigating through my timeline this way, and let me go ahead and load a clip into my uh, preview monitor. We'll take one of these dancing B-roll clips and just double click to load that in. So normally I've seen people, you know, they're scrubbing through, they find the in, they find the out. What I wanna do is I'm gonna find the spot. I hit the I key, marks an in point, play, or double tap. There's my out point. And now I'm ready to bring it into my timeline. And I can bring it into my timeline using either an overwrite edit or an insert edit. Okay, now normally a lot of folks I've been working with that are new to Premiere, they tend to drag things into the timeline. And as I said, that's fine. So if I wanted to drag this in, and I'm going to navigate a little bit through this timeline. And to do that, I want to zoom in or zoom out. Now hopefully I never see anybody grab this to zoom in and zoom out because the plus key and the minus key will allow you to very easily zoom in and zoom out. Now that's great. The other key that's very useful is the backslash key. The backslash key is a toggle that allows me to see my entire sequence, my entire timeline. And if I toggle it back, I go back to where I was. So that's nice. I'm gonna to toggle it, and then I'm gonna grab this clip, and if I drag it in, I'll have those in and out points, and wherever I drop it, it will go. Now, what if I wanted to insert it somewhere here? Okay, I can do that, or even if I'm at the end of my timeline. Well, I can do that with the keyboard shortcut that's directly below J, K, and L, and an overwrite edit would be the period key. I haven't had to move my hand. J, K, and L are three in a row, I and O are right above it, and comma and period are right below it. Period gives me an overwrite edit. So if I go over here, and this is my spot, and I wanna point something out that's a little confusing for folks that are new to Premiere, as well as some folks that have been using it for a while. And those are the little blue buttons that you see to the left side of the actual sequence. There's two sets of them, okay? You have one set over here, Okay, and then you have one set here on the inside. And people are like, I'm not sure what each of these do. So what they do, or what they're telling the computer to do, is anything on the left side is related to clips you are bringing into your sequence. So if you're bringing it anywhere into your sequence, that's going to affect it. The ones on the inside affects anything in your sequence. So when I hit that period button, and I'm gonna just go to the end of the timeline so you can see it, it's gonna put that clip on V1 because it's coming in to V1. So watch what happens. Go into V1. 
If I wanted it to come into the second track, I could click it there or the third track so I can target where I want things to go. And this is very, very useful because maybe I cut my basic show and then I want to bring in all my B-roll onto V2 and I don't know how to switch it and I have to drag it, so this is more functional. I just set my target track to V2 and just throw in all of that B-roll. And you can see here, if I press the period key again, it goes on that next row. And I want to point out the difference between the overwrite and the insert while we're here. So an overwrite will replace the clip. As a matter of fact, let me do some destructive editing here. And we'll go back to earlier on in the show. And maybe I'll put it at the very beginning. And here's a great keyboard shortcut. How many people here work on a laptop? OK? There's no home or end key on a laptop. So it's hard to go back to the beginning of your show. OK? One thing that you can do is the uh, up and down keys will jump you between edits. And the left and right keys will jump you back and forth one frame at a time. But if you have a full keyboard, you can hit home and end. On a laptop, if you hit the function key and the left arrow, it will go home. And of course, the function key and the right arrow will go to the end of your sequence. If you're on a clip, it will go to the beginning or the end of the clip. So I went to the beginning of the clip, and I want to just point out the difference between the overwrite and the insert edit. This is some foundations that we're talking about. So I have the clip. I'm going to use the same in and out point. If I hit the period button, it's an overwrite. Well, what it's going to do, and let me go back to my original target track, B1. And if I hit the period, it replaces, it obliterates everything there. I wanted to squeeze the clip in. Let me go ahead and hit undo. OK, and that's Control Z, Control Z on a PC, Command Z on a Mac. But I want to squeeze it in. I want to do what's called an insert edit. And there's buttons here, but right next to the period key is a comma, like you're wedging something in. And if I hit that key, it actually puts the clip in and pushes everything downstream. So that's a very efficient way. So JKL, I and O, comma, and period, all where your fingers are, allows you to navigate very quickly around a clip and do editing. So that's a good base, and I know many of you may have known much of that or some of that information. Hopefully for some of you it's a little bit new. But now I want to be able to have more control over my interface, okay? I want to be able to jump around without necessarily clicking my mouse. So normally, the workflow when we edit is what? We bring clips into our project through the media browser. We look at them often in our source monitor. We bring them into the timeline and view them you know, onto the output monitor to our playback. So we have four windows, one, two, three, and four. Now, a lot of times when you want to jump to a window, you have to click on it, right? You don't have to do that. You have windows one, two, three, and four. Shift the way that you're thinking. If you hit Shift-1, take a look at what happens. You'll see the blue bar. Shift-1 activates the first window. Shift-2, the second window. Shift-3, our timeline. And Shift-4, our program. So that's a very quick way to navigate if you want to jump around. But it gets a little bit better than that. So I can easily shift to any of those windows if I want to. But here's some other things I can do with that. Let's say I'm editing and I want to work with a handful of clips, OK? So normally, you would take a clip, you would edit, you would bring it into your timeline, you'd open a second clip, you'd edit, you'd bring it into your timeline, and you'd keep going. But what if you're using the same clips back and forth, say, an interview, or maybe you know, you're doing a narrative piece, so you have two people talking, so you have a master shot and two over-the-shoulder shots? Well, if you take a look underneath the little hamburger drop-down, these are the clips that I recently had used. So that's great. It's very easy to get to them. That's a great little shortcut. Okay, I can easily switch between those. But it takes, let's go that one step further. Okay, so if I wanted to, I could switch here, but let's say I'm gonna clear all of them out. Okay, I'm just gonna close all of those. And so we don't have anything here. Actually, I wanna close all. There we go. So instead of dragging our clips in and starting to edit, I might have a whole bin of clips down here, and all I need to do is lasso them and drag them into my source monitor. Now I have all the clips there at my fingertips instead of having to go back. A little bit cool, OK? So uh, thank you for the, the one person who woke up and applauded. So, but that's still time consuming. 
Remember I said I can switch to this window with Shift-2? If I keep tapping Shift-2, I can switch between all of the clips there that were available to me. And I can very quickly mark in and out points and use JKNL in my timelines. Good, I got a second person. Good. I only have 398 more to go, and we'll be successful. So that's a great little thing with the Shift-1, 2, 3, and 4, other than activating your windows. The other thing where Shift-3 is useful is how many times have you been playing along and you were, say, in this window, and you go here and you click on this window over here, and as soon as you click, it moves your playhead exactly where you don't want it to be because it was perfectly aligned. Well, that's where Shift-3 really comes into play because I can activate that window without accidentally moving the playhead. So that makes things nice again. Anybody here have multiple timelines open at the same time? Yes, we do. Let me open a couple of other, other timelines. I'm going to switch back up here, open up just a couple of sequences randomly. So I have four here, one's completely empty. But if I use Shift-3, which gets me to that window, and I keep tapping it, guess what it does? It toggles between all of my open sequences. So if you're jumping back and forth between two open sequences, it's really easy not to have to keep clicking and figuring out what your tab is. So that, again, is another really useful way to increase your workflow. Let's jump back to the keynote, which uh, was causing me a lot of problems before. And we're going to talk a little bit. I want to talk about something that has to do with sound. So one of the things that is always a challenge to me when I'm editing, and I'm going to open up a folder of music. So I'm going to double click to open that up. I'll use the tilde key to bring that full screen. There's only two cuts here. But when you bring in music and you start listening to it, does anybody ever get like their ears blown out because it's so loud? Absolutely, because when they record the music, they record it as close to zero dB as possible, so when people play it, they don't have to turn up the volume of their computers and whatnot. There's something you can do to adjust the volume of the clip before you bring it in. You can adjust the gain or how loud this is before. So one of the things that many of you may know, I'm going to go ahead and bring this a little bit smaller, hit the tilde key, is if I'm listening to a clip in my timeline, you know, you can keyframe it and whatnot, but I can also select a clip, and if I hit the G key for gain, it brings me to this dialog box where I can adjust the gain or set the gain. I'm going to use set gain, and I can go, you know what, I want it 10 dB less. I want it minus 10 dB. Now, before I hit OK, one of the things that you may be curious about is what's the difference between set gain and adjust gain. If I hit set gain, it is finite. It will get rid of any keyframes if I've keyframed the volume levels. If I hit minus 10, it goes to minus 10. If I hit minus 5, it goes to minus 5. If I hit minus 5 again, it stays at minus 5. So it goes to that absolute number. Adjust gain by is relative to where it is. So if I go minus 5, it gets 5 dB lower. If I go minus 5 again, it's now a total of 10 dB lower. And it will keep the keyframes. So that's one thing you can do to just make things louder and softer inside. But what you can do is, before you bring in music, you can select your entire folder of music inside your project panel. And then if you hit the G key, and this is what I do, I go set gain to minus 20. And now, all of this audio is 20 dB softer when I bring it in. So if I bring this into my program, and I'll go ahead and just bring in one of the clips. I will use the keyboard shortcut of a period to bring that in. And let's go ahead. And one of the things that tricked me up, and sometimes tricks everybody up, is it didn't go in. And I'm wondering why. So a lot of times you go, OK, I did an insert edit. I did something, but it's not activating. And if you notice, the problem is I don't have the target track live. OK? And this can work with you and work against you. But the key is once you know how it works, you can always have it work with you. So now if I hit that period key, and let me move my playhead a lot closer in, it brings it into the timeline, and I'm going to play it. And now I'm not blowing out my ears, and I can start mixing the music. So the takeaway is, before you bring in your music, just lasso everything inside your music folder, 
hit G for gain and just set your absolute value to minus 20, and now when you bring it in, life will be good. I do see a hand there. Does that work the same for video clips, this scenario? Yes. The question was, does that work the same for video clips? So all you're doing, yes, you're controlling the audio level. So let's go ahead and look at a video clip. We will hop up one level. We will select one of these video clips, and I'm going to bring this in twice, and I'm going to grab one of my interview clips because we'll have some good sound there. Well, not in a good quality sound because I'm using these to fix audio. So this is the level, and if I hit play... At the moment, I'm really enjoying Photoshop. It's pretty overmodulated. So again, have it selected. Hit minus 20. Well, probably for audio, I think I can probably get away with about uh, minus 12 for the narr narration. And now when I bring this clip in, and make sure I have that selected. Uh, I'll just do it this way. Undo, I keep moving things around. I think this was the one that I just worked with. Backslash. Company starting from last so you see before she was so peeking out. So if you know that your audio is all low, <laughs> bad audio. If, if you know your audio is low, you can bring it up before, bring it up afterwards. And you can also do this inside of your, your sequence. And this is really powerful because there's other ways you can leverage the gain control. So here is an important strategy when you're editing. A lot of times when we first start editing, we'll just throw things and the audio lands where the audio lands. But if you strategically place like all of your voiceover on track one and all of your interviews on track two and all of your music on three and all of your sound effects on four, then you can select that whole track. So if, for instance, I'm playing it back and somebody says, you know, I like it, but the music's a little bit too hot in the show, I can select just the music track, which would be track three, hit the G key, and bring it down relatively, okay, by maybe 3 dB, which is half the sound volume. Okay, so being organized and structured is a great way of getting to be, having more control in your edit. So, for instance, one of the things, and I'm going to zoom in here, is we look at our tracks, I have A1, A2, A3, so I have my voice over here. So if I want to select this track, I can select everything using a keyboard shortcut, and selecting all the tracks happens to be the keyboard shortcut of A, or I can lasso them. And then once I have all of those selected, I can simply, and we just want the single one, so we'll hit the V, undo, shift A. There we go. Deselect. Now everything is deselected. It's going backwards. I'll just do it this way. Oh, I know. I'm sorry. I was zoomed in, and that's why I wasn't hitting things right. So go back, select all these, these audio tracks. Yeah, I did. There we go. Alt, I'm on a Mac. They don't have Alt. No. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, sorry. There we go. It's, uh, it is all, thank you very much, it's optional on a Mac. Uh, so I can select all of those, I can hit the G key, and now instead of doing set gain two, I can adjust it, say, minus three dB, and that's gonna make her softer, and I can do that very quickly. So that's one of the nice features that you have when you're starting to work with the gain function. Ah, well, let me show, uh, the zoom in on the whole screen. Well, on a Mac, you can do it by holding the control key down and spinning your mouse or command option plus. On Windows, there's the magnifier. So it's not a, it's not a uh, premier function. But let's talk about some of the uh, premier functions here. I didn't want to hit exit. Let's hit, go ahead and bring that forward, hit hide, and come back here and talk a little bit about zooming in and control and navigation. Okay, because that's really important. Now, we talked at the very beginning, or I talked, and hopefully you listened, is you can zoom in to your sequence. And I'm going to bring this full screen with the tilde key. And let's go ahead and bring that home and get at, rid of these extra ones. I'm just going to delete that. So we have our window. And here's a perfect example of why I love the tilde key, not the tilde key, the backslash key. Uh, I didn't realize I had a clip hanging out here at the end. But that backslash zooms me in and zooms me out. And I can tell you there have been times I've exported a one minute commercial. And it took forever. And then I realized that I exported 15 minutes because I threw something like 15 minutes down my timeline. So silly me, but please learn from my mistakes. 
So let's talk a little bit about getting around and navigating uh, our timelines. As a matter of fact, I'm going to mess this up just a little bit. Okay, I put that about right there, and I know I'm stepping on that, but that's okay. That's not what I'm really going to show you. So first of all, we know zoom in and zoom out is plus and minus, okay? But there are times when I want to be able to make my individual tracks taller and smaller because maybe I'm working with video, maybe I'm working with audio. And of course, one of the things you can do is you can easily you know, grab the edges here and bring it up. And I say easily because it's really not that easy. But there are ways that are alternative ways that you can do that. So for instance, if I hit Alt plus and minus, it makes just the audio tracks bigger. Okay? And if I hit Command or Control on Windows plus and minus, it makes just the video tracks bigger. So I can very easily control what I'm doing. And then, of course, if you hold the Shift key down, you can also use your mouse to make these bigger. So these are all very nice ways to do things. And I can also do individual tracks. But most of the time when I'm editing, I either want to see things kind of big, or I want to see things all encompassing to see where everything is. I either want them big or small. So the Shift key is where the magic comes into play with track heights. Shift plus will make them all equal at a certain size, and Shift minus will make them nice and thin. So this is what I do a lot when I'm editing, and I'm going to hit the tilde key to bring it back down. So I can, if I'm editing way and I want to see everything, Shift plus, I go through and it's like, oh, I need to see all of my tracks without changing my resolution, I can hit Shift minus. So Shift plus and Shift minus are really useful ways of being able to control how I'm viewing my tracks. So that's one of the things that's really nice. Let's talk a little bit more about some of our navigation options. And I'm going to hit Shift plus so you can see what's happening. So I'm going to go through here. And if I wanted to jump to the edit point of a clip, I can use the up and down arrows. And that will jump me to the previous or next clip's edit point. So I don't have to move my mouse. And it hits it precisely. So I'm going up and down. And it's stopping at all of my clips, but it doesn't seem to be stopping at this one here, which is on the second row. And I'll bring this so you can see everything. And it's not stopping at the beginning. Okay? So the shift, uh, the up and down kind of works, but it really is working because I want to tell you how it's thinking. So up and down will automatically stop on any edit point where the track is targeted on the inside. That goes to what I talked about earlier. So if I click on this button here, now when I use up and down, it stops actually on the edit points on both of those tracks. And for instance, if I was just cutting B-roll and I wanted to jump between all the clips on just the second line, I could unclick that first track, and now it only jumps between the clips on the second track. So that gives me a lot of power. But Here's where we can make it just a little bit easier. And I'm going to extend the size of my tracks a little bit more. Let me go ahead and bring in a couple of clips, make a third line and a fourth line. For those people who do dragging and dropping, you know, you can just drag a clip in and drop it on where you want. Uh, but you know something? I'm not really a big fan of the audio there. You know, I brought in the video, but I don't want the audio. So how many people have brought in a clip, and then they have to figure out, OK, I, I lock all my tracks. And then I delete the, this, and then I unlock my tracks. Or maybe I figure out that there's an unlinking button. First of all, let me undo that. When I drag anything, and if you choose to drag, you don't always have to go from the main picture. You can drag these little icons here. Okay, So that's video only, and that's audio only. So if I only want the video, I can grab that, drag that in, and now I just have the video. And I don't have to worry about going through all those steps. So that's great for dragging. I'm going to undo that again. Okay? I can also use the same technique of the track targeting here to control what I bring in. So for instance, if I target here, it's going to bring the video onto track three. And if I don't want the audio, I just click to turn it off. Okay? So now we'll only bring in the video because I've unpatched it. So if my playhead is there and I hit that period for the overwrite key, it goes exactly where I want it to be. So that's really taking advantage of the magic of these tabs here. I'm going to reset this back to where I want it to be, to the original, just so I keep myself out of trouble. OK. So we know how we can easily jump between edit points. We know how we can go to the beginning and the end and zoom in and zoom out. Let's hop back over to the keynote presentation. We fixed our audio. 
Um, we moved the meters before, so we've talked about that. We talked about um, modifying tracks. You can also modify an audio file. So we talked about G for gain, but if you go back and you go onto a clip and maybe the audio isn't coming out how you anticipated it, maybe it was recorded and Premiere thinks it's a stereo track when it's actually an interview uh, and it's two separate mics, if you take any clip, whether it's video and audio or audio only, you can right click on it and you can modify the audio channels before you bring it in. And when you do that, you can choose, and let me go ahead and zoom in here so you can see a little bit better. Okay, is this mono? No, maybe it's stereo or is it dual mono? So you can tell it exactly what type of file it is and now it will split it or bring it back together if it's been interpreted wrong because of the way it was recorded. So you can also get to that by hitting Shift G in your keyboard shortcuts when you select a clip. There we go, that's a quick way to go to it without having to go to the drop down windows. Shift G, G for gain, just like you use to make something louder. We talked about the JKL, we talked about the order of work, one, two, three, four. The important thing is shift one, two, three, four, because that way it works really well. Now this is something else that I really like about this, and I didn't tell you about this earlier. This happens to me a lot. I know it happens to other people in the room. You lose your project. Maybe you've, you've closed it or you've moved it somewhere. You don't know where it is. And the nice thing about this, I'm going to hit reset here so I can intentionally close this. So we're going to uh, close this uh, panel. So how many times have you like, not been able to even find <laughs> the project panel? It's like, I don't know. It's moved here somewhere. or Maybe it's off and it's below the drop down to the right. No matter what, when you hit Shift-1, it will bring that right to the front, so you don't have to waste time looking for it. And that's really, really useful. So sometimes if you've lost a window, that Shift-1, 2, 3, and 4 will bring that window into play. There's a couple of other windows that I use a lot that I like to use these keyboard modifiers. Okay, get to the question in just one second. So, uh, things I do a lot is effects and effects control. Effects gives me the list of the effects that I'm working with, and effects control will let me to allow me to modify them. So a lot of times when I'm editing, I very quickly want to toggle back and forth to find things, and I don't want to click and search and whatnot. So if you hit Shift-5, it will bring you to the Effects Control tab of looking at your clip, and Shift-7, ignore Shift-6, will actually open up your Effects tab. And all of these shortcuts work great no matter what workspace that you're in. So if I'm working in my effects workspace where everything is in different places, once again, Shift-5 will jump me to my effects control tab, and Shift-7 will jump me to my effects so I can quickly find the effect that I was looking for. And yes, there was a gentleman who had his hand up. No, the question was if I've moved the shift or the program monitor to the second window, would I hit shift two? No, shift one will always find it wherever it is on the interface. And one of the other things is if you have multiple projects open, I know some of you do that, it's a great way to toggle between the two projects. So shift one will actually take you between two open or three open projects, just like shift two took you between all the clips and shift three took you between all of your sequences that are open. Good question, thank you very much. Okay, let's see what, what amazing notes that I have that I'm kind of skipping and not skipping, I'm just doing it a lot of order because I think this is worth working better. Um, this is actually one of the nice features that a lot of people don't use, is first of all, when you import, and I'm gonna reset my windows again back to the default so everybody knows where to look. When you bring things in, you should always bring them in, and I wanna clean this up over here, Got my menu browser. You should always bring them in, not through import command I, but through the media browser, because the advantage of working through the media browser is that you can actually, whether on Windows or Mac, see the clips and, and skim through them, and it brings in all the metadata and will co correlate things. So that's the important thing, but what's challenging sometimes with the media browser, and I'm gonna bring this full screen, is you open it up and you like have to dig down through the hierarchy of your System, so you go, okay, my internal drive, and then I have to go to my user, and there's my user, and I wanna to go to my desktop to find out where it is, and I'm gonna pull this to the side, and then there's all my class media, okay? All you need to do is right click on the folders that you go to frequently, your media folder, your movies folder, your picture folder, and you make it a favorite. 
And once you make it a favorite, you'll never have to dig again because it will always be available to you in the upper left corner, in the top part of your interface. And you can pop right there and I can say, oh, I want to find all the media that's on my desktop. And you can click on that and you can immediately dig into your folders. So that's a really useful you know, shortcut to create that ultimately saves you time. So it's better to take the two or three minutes to do it right the first time and then forever you can easily find where your media and everything is stored. I see a hand over there to the left. Yes, sir. You, you can drag it in. There are some things that you can't do that way. For instance, if you want to bring in, um, if there's spanned clips, in other words, uh, some cameras record across multiple clips because they can only record a certain amount of time. Uh, so it depends on the cameras. If it's just a quick time movie, a lot of times you can drag them in and they work just fine. What I do see is I see people who are used to using the traditional way of import command I, and when you import, actually, that's not, it will work, but it doesn't bring it to the best advantage. Additionally, I don't know if anybody here does time lapse. Anybody here do time lapse, any photographers? So you have, you know, 400 images. So if you, you, you need to bring those in, there's a setting, you know, I've seen people bring in and they bring them in and they go, each one is one frame long and then it just takes forever. It's a lot of work. So what are the secrets with time lapse is, whether you're in the media browser or through import, there's a little checkbox that says import as image sequence. Again, this is great for graphic designers who might be exporting out an animation. So if you say import as an image sequence, it will bring it in and it will look just like a movie clip and you can just hit play and work with it like that. And that's really the secret, but the trick is checking that one box, which is in the media browser under the little hamburger or drop down menu, and that gives you import as image sequence. It is critical that numerically you don't have any gaps because it will stop the image sequence if there's a number that is missing. Let's jump back over here. I, I, I'm talking about what I'm doing. You can see I'm jumping. But uh, another thing to do with the media browser is that you can actually have multiple media browsers open. So you can say window. Of course, uh, I want to go file, open a new, new browser, new media browser. I'm switching between applications. My brain just waiting. It's good to know that you guys are patient. New media browser panel. So I click that, and now I actually will have two media browsers. I'm going to bring this over here. And the nice thing about having two media browsers, and I can nicely take advantage of my favorites, and I'll go over here under favorites, and I'll just do dance overview edit, is I can easily, I'm going to bring this full screen by hitting the tilde, is if I want to bring in clips, I can just have those open, go back and grab the clips and drag them over. So I don't have to keep switching between locations. So maybe I have some in my external drive and I have that media browser open. I created a second one and I have also some on my internal drive. So instead of always having to switch back and forth, I just have two media browsers available to me, toggle back and forth between them and just grab the footage as I need it. Well, I find that is really helpful. Let's take a look at another way that we can uh, enhance our workflow. And I'm gonna jump back into my project. I'm gonna hit tilde. I have no idea right now where my project main file is, but I know if I hit shift one, it will find it for me immediately. And I'm gonna step into one of the areas here. I'm gonna go into uh, dancing B-roll and bring this full screen. So you can look at it as a list, but it's also nice that you can switch over here and you can look at it, in addition to a list, you can look at it as an icon view, and that's command page up or page down to toggle or control on Windows to switch between that. And then, of course, you can make these bigger. So the nice thing about this, and this is great when you're working with still images, but I can, in this mode, just move my mouse over without selecting anything and see what these clips are. This is, you know, I can skim through this. I can hover scrub, scrub through this. And this is great for finding a clip. But other things I can do is if I click on this, it selects it, and now if I wanted to, I can use the JKL that we learned earlier to navigate through this clip. And while I'm in this mode, it's not just maybe looking at the clip. I can use my I and O key to mark an in point and an out point, I'm gonna really zoom in so you can see there's a little, so now I've marked the in and out point while I'm inside of my project window. So I can go through all my clips, 
highlight the best areas, and now when I either bring them into my timeline or bring them into my source monitor, the in and out points have been already marked, and that's great. And you can do this a couple of ways. With it selected, you can use J, K, and L. When you hover scrub, J, K, and L doesn't work because you're using your mouse, but I and O still works to mark your in points and your out points as you hover over these. So that's another nice functionality of this. So if I went through and marked all the in and out points, let's go back to full screen, um, I'm gonna make a new sequence just so I can bring these in. And there's a couple ways you can do that. If you go Command N or Control N, it makes a new sequence, and then you are confused by this nightmare of a dialog box. It's like, what do I pick? This is very confusing, and none of these are appropriate to me, which is usually people's first reaction. If you want to do it here, you can, what I would recommend is do DSLR, and then use either 24, 25, or 30, depending on if you're NTSC or PAL, European or US styles, or if you're doing film. That's usually what you want, and it gives you 1920 by 1080. If you pick the wrong thing, and let me just intentionally pick the wrong thing here, when I first bring in a clip, you will get a warning. This clip does not match. And all you have to do is say change sequence settings, and it will change the settings so it perfectly matches your footage of the first clip that you put in. But any additional clips that you put in will always go to what the sequence setting is from the first clip. So if you have a bunch of different formats, and if 80% or 90% of those clips are you know, the same camera, same format, but it might not be the first clip in your show, still bring that in at the beginning, because you can always then keep throwing the other clips in, because it sets the right format, and then just go ahead and delete or move that first clip that you drop in. But it also gets a little bit easier than that. You can click on any clip that you want, and if you right click on it, you'll get a pop-up, and one of the options in the pop-up is say, you don't even have to start by saying make a new sequence. Just select a clip and say create a new sequence from this clip, click on that, it will name the sequence after the clip, it will put the clip inside, and it will be the proper format, and that saves you a lot of time. So once again, it's just a matter of right-clicking and saying make a new sequence from the clip. Now, a few moments ago, I did talk about the fact that you, know, you can mark your in and out points in all of these clips as you go through, and that's great. And let me make these a little smaller because I'm gonna actually show you another couple of great little things you can do because you've gone through, you've worked really hard to mark the in and out points. So I'm just resizing the screen so you can see things better. And if I wanted to, if I've marked all these to tell a story, this is all B-roll, but imagine you kind of figured out what you wanted. I can select a bunch of clips. I just held down the shift key and lassoed them. And what I can do is, first of all, let me just get rid of that so it doesn't distract us, is I can take all of these. I could drag them over here and let go and they're gonna put all the clips in with the right, let's see if I can zoom back and hold down the mouse at the same time, there we go. Um, it will put in all the clips with the in and out points that I already marked. So it's a quick way to kind of set things up. But it will put them into a numerical value or basically A, a to Z or one to whatever. So I'm gonna hit undo. You can see it, it brought all those in. As a matter of fact, let's make sure our audio is tracked right there because I had moved before. I'm gonna hit undo bring those back out, and just make sure that my audio is live here. I'm gonna bring in one clip. There we go. This is, oh, there is no audio on these clips. This is all B-roll without sound. Okay, which I could have known because there's no icon there that says there's sound. Okay, so here's another trick that you can do. I can select the order that I want these clips to go into my timeline, okay? by holding down the Command key on a Mac or the Control key on Windows and just select them in the specific order that I want them on the timeline. I can then drag those down to this little icon right here. And what this will allow me to do is when I let go, I get this pop-up. And it says, Automate to Sequence. And it will put them in. It gives me the option to do it sequentially, so that's alphabetically or numerically, but actually, I want to put these in, oh, I'm sorry, right up here, selection order, sort order, which is alphanumerically, or selection order. And what this does with it checked is it will allow me to, uh, the order that I clicked on them is the order that they go into the timeline. 
And that's really a game changer. And I can say, use the in and out points if it's, a, if it's a still, if I'm using markers. And I can even have it put in transitions, which is great if I'm doing a slideshow very quickly. And this is one of the great things about slideshows that you can fix. Let's uh, say OK. You can see what it, what it does. Brought in all of those clips in the order that I clicked on them. Some did have sound and some did not. OK, let's go ahead and clear that out. I want to show you a couple of trimming techniques. I'm going to go ahead and reset my windows, because I want to show you some great little shortcuts that you can use for trimming. And all I did was I double clicked on the editing workspace, allows me to go ahead and reset that, so we're ready to go. I'm going to open up uh, one of my sequences that has just a, a few clips in it. We'll look at this, perhaps we'll use the uh, core editing. So I have some clips here, and I want to talk to you a little bit about trimming or fine tuning. Because the way that I like to edit is I like to bring in my clips a little bit fat. I don't worry about that fine tuning to find the precise moment when I'm just throwing them on the timeline. I want to kind of get it in to figure out my story first. And then I want to go in and clean things up. So that's the thing. Bring them all in like I did with that uh, automated sequence. And now I can go in and I can start trimming. And this is the way that a lot of people would trim. They would want to get this little piece off, OK? They, and so they want to trim off from here to here. So they go in. They switch over to the razor blade. Uh, they cut this. This might look familiar to some of you. You're going, yeah, I do that. And then they switch to the V key or the arrow. They select it. Then they delete it. And then they bring this back. And, and they're good to go. And then they do that again and again and again. Way, way, way inefficient. Do I? I'm hearing sounds. Oh, you agreed. OK. I, I, I thought you were revolting. I didn't know. I mean, not revolting, but you know. I was like, um, kind of crazy. I, I, as I do things, I like to kind of throw some of these side tips in. Um, so let me go ahead and clean up my windows. There we go. We have the music. So let's say I want to edit this. There's efficient ways of doing it. It's called the trim. There's trim edits and there's ripple trims. You might see that when you hover your mouse over an edit point, you get this little red bracket here, which points in a certain direction. If I drag it, it allows me to trim off to where I want to cut a clip. And as a matter of fact, if I was full screen, it's great because you see exactly what the last frame is up in that upper right window. So this is nice, but you still have to deal with that gap. And it's not saving, it saves you a lot of time, but not all the time you could, because then I have to delete the space in the gap. So in addition to these two trim windows, left and right, I should say trim tools, there's also something called a ripple trim. And the keyboard shortcut for that is B. You can get to your ripple trim tool here. When you hover over any of these, uh, it'll tell you what the tool is. But what I'm thinking is I want to bring the edit along as I close it. That's how I remember the keyboard shortcut for that, for a ripple trim. It's B for bring it along or it would be the B key. I'm going to click on it now. Now you'll notice when I hover over this, it's yellow. And it's going to work a little bit differently. When I click on that and I drag it to the left and let go, not only does it trim the clip, but it snaps it closed again. So this is an awesome way to go through an eyeball to trim clips using the, trim, the ripple trim tool. And that's keyboard shortcut B. Is that new to anybody? Hopefully, yes, good. So life is good. I'm going to make life a little bit better. Okay? Um, so I can bring the clip along, and that's great. But there's a couple of other keyboard shortcuts that are really useful when I start going through and trimming. Here, I actually have to select them and drag them, and that's great. And as a matter of fact, if I zoom all the way out, you can see the clip that I'm trimming, it shows me the end, and the other one's static, so I can match the frame to make sure it works. And the same thing if I move forward. One of the nice things about this is, let me switch back to the traditional tool, is you, know, you saw that I can move this to the left okay, and let go. But if you move it to the right with the red tool, as soon as you hit that next clip, it stops you. It's trying to protect you from yourself. Okay, but I know there's extra media on that clip, and I really want to do it. So I don't want to go and have to drag it out and then bring it forward. Let me undo that. That same bring it with me tool, that same keyboard shortcut of B, I'm undoing just to get me back to where I was. OK, I hit the B key, or there. Now, left we saw what it can do, but I can also push it. So as long as there's enough media on the original clip, I can add to it without going through all these gyrations of lassoing, moving to the right, 
stretching it out. I'm right there. So I love using these all the time. I actually love it so much that I don't want to have to hit the B key to do it. I want it to do it all the time. And I can change a setting to change that default. So what I'm going to do is I'll go up, and this is a good thing to, to take a note of, though it will be in the, in the deck, is you go up to your preferences, and we're trimming here. Okay, and underneath trim, there is an option that says, allow the selection tool to choose roll and ripple trims without a modifier key. I'll tell you about rolls in just a second, but I'm gonna click on that. So now I've changed that preference and I'll hit okay. When I'm back here with my selection tool, that's the arrow tool, your default. If usually something's going wrong, the arrow will get you back into place. Now you'll notice without having to switch to the bring along key, the B key, when I hover over the corners or the edges, it always gives me that yellow ripple trim tool. So I can very quickly just do what I want. And I like that, that's much faster. If I wanted the other way of doing it, I wanna point something out that happens a lot when you're, and you don't see it. When you're doing things in Premiere, in the lower left corner are these great little pop-ups that we never look at. And if I hover over here, you'll notice that there's a, uh, a little tip that says drag edge of ripple to trim selection, shift trailing clips, or sometimes you can hit modifiers. And if I hit the modifier of the command key, let me stay zoomed in here. So my default is now yellow, but if I hit command, I can get back to the regular old trim tool if I need it. So I still have full control, so it becomes much more efficient but I also now have easy access to something called the Roll Tool, and the Roll Tool is really powerful because what it allows me to do is change the actual edit point by changing the out point of the first clip and the in point of the following clip. Sometimes you want to like, you know, move it a little bit, you know, that everything's good, but maybe you want it to hit on the beat of the music, so you need to move the edit point, point. and the way that a lot of people normally have done that, who don't know all the keyboard shortcuts, is like, okay, I'm gonna take this, Bring that out, stretch this out a little bit, shorten this a little bit, I gotta grab that, it's not even hard to grab it, and then close the gap, and I've done it. But it's a lot of guesswork. With the ripple, roll, with the roll tool, okay, I click on this, I get a solid red bar, okay, so I'm getting this because I changed that setting. You can always get to uh, this if you don't change the setting by going to your tools menu, and one of the things you should know on all of the Adobe applications is when you have any kind of a little triangle, that indicates there are additional tools underneath the tool that is showing. So underneath Ripple, because it's part of the same family, there is the rolling edit tool. But we've already done that really cool preference change, and now what I can do, and I wanna zoom out so you can see what's in the upper right corner of the screen, is as I do that roll edit, okay? Did I just change my, I changed my key there, there we go. There we go. I'm moving the last frame of the first clip and the first frame of the second clip so I can see where that cut is happening. And this is great if I just want to kind of change if I'm doing this on a beat of music or when maybe they're saying something different on an interview. It allows me to tweak things, allows me to fine tune things without having to start moving a lot of clips around. And I really like those. So those are great, but there's a couple of other tools that are just as, if not even more efficient. And this is absolutely probably my favorite keyboard shortcuts. It's the Q key and the W key in the upper left corner of the keyboard, they're right next to each other. And sometimes when I'm working, and I'm gonna make this uh, zoom out a little bit, is I'll be playing and I'll know that I wanna trim everything off up until that point, because I'm listening to it. I don't wanna have to go in, grab that tool and, and drag it, which you can do, but if I hit the Q key without any clips selected, okay, just where the playhead is parked, let me go ahead and deselect my edit point so this works. And once again, you gotta make sure that your target tracks are working because it only will cut on the tracks that are live. That's the inside dealing with what's in the sequence. If I hit the Q key, it cuts off everything to the left of the playhead. And then I play along and then I go, okay, I wanna be out at that point. So I'm just using JKL. I hit the W key, it cuts everything to the right of the playhead. So this is great, I can very quickly go through, say I don't want that beginning part, Q. Play ahead a little bit more, right after that motion. I'm gonna play back a little bit. 
W. Q and W, a real great way. It's called Tops and Tails. It allows you to trim to the playhead, left or right, and you just think about Q and W, your fingers are right there, and it's a great way to get uh, and clean things up, especially an interview. I'll show you another interview trick. Was that new to some of you, hopefully? Yes, you're getting new things. I'm speaking quick, I know. I want to get you a lot of information. You can take pictures. There's going to be a slide deck that you can get, which probably has more information. As a matter of fact, in addition to that, I have a two-page sheet that you'll get, which are my favorite keyboard shortcuts and why I use them. Okay, so um, I know this is a fire hose of information, but I also realize some people knew half of the keyboard shortcuts and some people knew none of them. Yes, sir. The question was, if I have multiple tracks, does it cut to the first header point? The Q and W will cut to where the playhead is parked. So we'll cut all of them to where the playhead is, no matter what, as long as that inside blue buttons on those tracks are lit. So that's how you can, and that's really where people, that's one of the things that's hard to get, but once you get it, it's that aha moment. And, and that's one of the great things about it. So just keeping track of our time. We have 10 more minutes here in this, in this session. So. Q and W, we now know how we can do a lot of our trimming. We now know how we can easily navigate through a lot of our clips. Let's jump back here to our notes to see where we are and what we've done. We looked at the multiple browsers and the two browsers. A couple of little things. Undo. Undo is always the things that save us, but a lot of people don't realize there are, oh, is a way to actually have 100 levels of undo in Premiere. It's not the default. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and hide this first of all. A lot of people don't even know that you can see exactly what you've done in your history panel. Okay, so the history panel by default is located in the same location as the left project panel. So if I click on that, I can see all of the edits that I've done, but it, generally I believe the default is 20 edits. Well, we have pretty much faster computers than when they set this seven, eight years ago when they went to Premiere Pro. So if you also go under the history panel, you can go up under settings, and in settings, okay, it's 32, you can change that to 100, and now I have 100 levels of undo if I really, 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 really have made a lot of mistakes. So that's one of the things that is nice, uh, and it just uses up a little bit more RAM. So there you go. Let's zoom back out so you can read that. Oh, I wanna show you the, uh, a really great little drag thing that a lot of people aren't, this, this is a drag now. Um, you know, we talked about insert and overwrite and dragging and targeting and all that. But what a lot of people don't realize, actually, I'm going to park this kind of in the middle right there, is if I drag a clip over from my source monitor to the program monitor, I get a really cool pop-up that I didn't know was there and a lot of people don't know is there. And by the way, you can only do some of these things by dragging it. There isn't a keyboard shortcut to do it. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see what it says. Okay, so hopefully... If you drag it into the middle, it does, and insert edit wherever your playhead is parked or your endpoint is. But I can drag it and automatically have it put it one track above my target track. So if I'm doing titles, if I'm doing B-roll, I just drag it and it puts it on one track above. I can do an overwrite edit, we've seen that. I can do a replace edit, I'll show you what that looks like in just a moment, and I can also say insert before or insert after. Zooming back out, which is, Hard to do with, unless I had three hands. So right now, if I drag this over, instead of having to move the playhead and I just want to put it between these two clips, drag it here and I say insert after, it will put it on that edit point. If I have this over here and I drag this and I say insert before, puts it before that edit point. So that's great. This is kind of a, a really cool thing that I couldn't do with any of my keyboard shortcuts. And let's talk a little bit about overwrite. Overwrite, I'm not, sorry, overwrite, replace. Replace allows you to swap out a clip that you might have, have chosen. Again, I don't like digging for where my media is. I hit shift one. You're starting to see this is becoming really useful as you have limited real estate. And now I can go in and I can select uh, another clip and I'm gonna just arbitrarily click on uh, maybe this color correction one. Uh, don't do color glasses, do, well, do some more dancing. And another color dress. So there I have this. And I want that shot here that I have to replace this shot here. So what I can do is, with the playhead over there, I simply go over here and I say, replace, and it swaps out that clip with this other clip. So it's very easy. I don't have to go in, delete, and stretch it out. Now, 
does it assume, with a modif the question was, does it assume it's actually, you can do a replace edit with the keyboard and a modifier that can do it. This will not, because this one just swaps it out. But uh, if you drag, so a replace edit, you can drag a clip on, and then if you hit the uh, Alt or the Option key, it'll do a replace, and then I think if you do Shift Alt Option, I'll check on that, you can do it replace underneath, and it will maintain its filters or plugins. Okay, but that's a really nice thing. Now, by default, it will when you swap something out. Did I just swap it back? I guess I did. Um, is this clip might be longer or shorter than the other one. It matches from the end point of the first clip to the end point of the other clip because, you know, it doesn't want to change the duration of your show to mess things up. But one thing you can do is you can do what's called a slip or a slide edit to change the timing. Okay, so if we go over here, and I'm just going to scrub through it, she jumps and does this great leap, but I really want it to be not this part of the leap. If I look at the original clip, let's see if I can scrub through, there we go. I want to catch her right in midair, okay? So I could go back, I could try to change the endpoint and guess, but no, I just wanted this to go in, and now I want to adjust the timing of the in and out point of the clip in the timeline, okay? What I really want to do is I want to slip the in and the out point simultaneously, so instead of seeing her jumping at this point in the leap, it's this point in the leap. And what you do is you do what's called a slip edit. And the slip edit, the keyboard shortcut is Y, but there is a little button for it. Uh, if we go over, and it's funny, I never remember what the click is because I always use the keyboard shortcuts. But if you go here under, uh, I believe it's here under the slip tool. So it's the Y key. I think that there's two clips on the side and I'm adjusting the one in the middle. So with that, and this is the way people have done it. I'm gonna just show you very quick. This is not the way to do it. Um, you know, they would go up, and then they would stretch this out, and they would stretch this out, and they would hope that it fits and brings it in. Okay, we don't do that. I'm going to undo that all the way. If I hit the Y key, the slip tool, now when I click on this, take a look at what I see in the right, upper right-hand window. I see a breakout of four images. Upper left is the end of the first clip. Upper right is the end of the th beginning of the third clip. Those aren't going to move, but as I move my mouse back and forth, I can see the beginning and the end of the clip that's in the middle. This is a slip edit, so I want to pick it up just as she leaps in the air. And then I let go of my mouse, and when I play that back, I have the, the leap that I want. So that's a slip edit, and it's really powerful. It's the Y key. Complementing that, and, and then I'll be wrapping up, is something called a slide edit. A slide edit is very similar to a slip edit, except maybe I have the timing right, but I really want to have that clip happen a little bit earlier or have it later. This is great for like if you have a reaction shot or cutaway of some two people talking and the person's nodding their head, but you want them to nod earlier or later. So what's happening inside that middle clip is exactly the part of the image you want to see. You just want to happen earlier or later. So instead of slipping it under, you want to slide it up and down and underneath the slip toolbar or the U key, which is what it is, if I click and hold, you can see this, is the slide tool, okay? That's the U key. And I think the U, it's not pointing between them, it's looking at the two sides. I try to remember based upon shape. And what I can do here, when I have that selected, is when I click on it, and I move this left or right, look at my interface, it changes. The top two little pictures are the frozen beginning and end of her leap. The ones on the left and right are the last frame of the first clip and the first of the third clip, the first frame of the third clip. And I can move it down and let go, and as long as there's enough media, I can easily slide it up and down the timeline. And the important thing is I'm doing this because I don't want to change the duration of those three clips in my timeline. So I don't have to worry about making the timeline longer or shorter. Slip and slide doesn't affect the duration of your show, just the relationship of those three clips. And the way that you can remember this, and this is you know, something that how I remember it, if it's winter, you're not in LA, you're walking on ice, and you slip, your feet go up in the air and your butt lands on the ground. You are physically in the same place, but a different part of you is touching the ground. You've slipped, okay? If later on the day, you're walking on the same ice, silly you, and you slide, your feet are still on the ground, but you're in a different location. So a slide allows you to move a clip up and down, and a slip allows you to trim underneath. And those are just some of the, the hidden, hidden things, or not so hidden things, that will make your editing a lot faster and a lot quicker. 
but the, uh, the JKL, the I, you know, these are some of the things that once I forced myself to really stick to those keyboards, especially that shift one, two, three, and four, which may not have seemed really cool when I first told you about it, but did you see how many times I, I used it to find where I was without having to hunt? So with that, it is now 2.15, and that was a boatload of information. Uh, I want to, if you have any, you know, feel, this, I'm going to give me my contact information, which is kind of crazy. If I can go back to the, uh, here we go to our keynote, and let's just hit uh, go home. That's this. This is the class. You'll get, uh, I will upload uh, this as well as some other information in this slide deck. Just, you know, give you some hints, as well as uh, a two-sheet all my favorite keyboard shortcuts, so that should be available to you after Wednesday, I think after uh, Max ends. Uh, they will upload all the presenters' things. So if you heard something and you didn't quite get the note or didn't quite take the picture, uh, feel free to reach out. I get a couple hundred emails a day, and like this week I won't check anything until Wednesday. Uh, so if you had a question or concern, feel free to badger me, send a second email a couple days later because sometimes it just drops off the bottom and I can hopefully reference some of your questions. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of Bash.